we could have already known a lot of this science like as the general public, but it's been so historically suppressed, um, mm-hmm. which is something I think that happens for a lot of communities in science because it is so historically dominated by like rich old white men. This episode and others like it are brought to you by the generous support of my patrons over on Patreon. If you'd like early access to every video, ad-free content, and access to our Discord server, consider joining our community. Hello and welcome to Closeted History, the podcast where we out the queer and trans history that you never knew. My name is Destiny. I use she, they pronouns, and today I am joined by Workers Reading. Do you want to introduce yourself, Charlie? Sure. Hi, my name's Charlie with Workers Reading. Um, This is a labor union book club, so we talk about all things labor-related. That might be labor history in nonfiction, but also any kind of employment stuff in fiction, and then everything that kind of connects to that, because everything's connected. (laughs) Yep, it's all related. (laughs) Well, so today we are going to be discussing the documentary that recently came out, Queer Planet. It was put on by Peacock. Um, Essentially, it could be chalked up to nature is gay. You (laughs) never knew. (laughs) So we're going to talk about our thoughts today. Overall, what did you think about it? I really liked it. I thought they did a good job of balancing some of the things that people might have heard of already. Um, And Mm -hmm. then and like just animals that are recognizable and charismatic and iconic and adding in some other fun facts, like including fungi a little bit and other things that people might not be as interested in, but then might now be interested in. Yeah, and I liked the way that they kind of like divided it. They went to different parts of the world and looked at animals in each part. And so I thought that was super cool. I I also liked it. Um, I hated the announcer, though. <laughs> I feel like like the very stereotypical gay quips were just like not my thing. I didn't like that part, but I, I really enjoyed it. And I like that they kind of took it from like, this is what we've noticed in sexual relationships, but then they also included a good bit about asexual animals and the way that they see that in nature as well. Uh, as well. So I thought that was cool. Yeah, I definitely agree. I know the. I'm pretty sure that the narrator is a Broadway actor who's gay, but I think that they wrote it a little bit over the top too. Um, but I liked in the yeah. beginning, they kind of did like a almost like a, a fake out of like, this is super masculine and super patriotic. Like, look at this big horn sheep. And then they were like, actually, like, don't worry, <laughs> we're, we're not doing that. <laughs> they're, they're actually um, very gay. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the penguins were first in New York City. Mm-hmm. Um, they were looking at two penguins named Elmer and Lima. And they built a nest together and, like, had a territory together. They even raised a chick. And I I thought that that was, like, such a cool part of it all. You know, some of the eggs that subsequently get left behind that, you know, our, our same-sex couples also get an opportunity to, to have a family in that way. Yeah, I think I think that's really important to include because I feel like, you kind of often hear the argument that like this type of relationship or this kind of family dynamic is not like in nature anywhere else. And like, it's not beneficial to like evolution or survival, but it not only is just completely natural and really, really common in nature, but even more important for the survival of a species because it's a lot of times families adopting chicks that otherwise would have just died and like, that affects the population in a really dramatic way, especially when they talk later about like flamingos just abandoning a lot of the times because they're so like flighty and scared. Um, You could see how really critical having these kinds of family dynamics are. Mm -hmm. And I think that was at the Rosamond Gifford Zoo, which is in Syracuse. So it was kind of weird that they focused so much on New York City and then they went like six hours upstate (laughs) from there. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's cool because I think in like almost all of the species that they were looking at that the numbers were like close to 30% at least in multiple species and that that's 
kind of what we see reflected in humans Mm -hmm. as well that like you know i think the statistic now is like one in four people is gay yep um because gen z is very queer and so like you know that it's a natural occurrence and i i really love how that was emphasized throughout the movie um that you know it's just normal it's a variation of evolution um yeah so yeah i I really enjoyed it it is really cool the the same like the percentages are so like common throughout species i think it, it is exactly one in four they were saying like mating for giraffes are just two males and like mm-hmm. seeing that line throughout. Um, but also I think that they did a really good job of focusing on or or making a clear point about how often like we could have already known a lot of this science like as the general public, but it's been so historically suppressed, um, mm-hmm. which is something I think that happens for a lot of communities in science because it is so historically dominated by like rich old white men. Um, mm-hmm. But it it is very cool to see people talking about it so much and saying like, this is not like a couple species do it. And like, no one else does like so many species are gay and it is probably a little bit more common to be gay than anything else. Yeah. I think like one, one segment was like that it was out of the norm for you to not be queer for one specific species. I can't remember which one, but the documentary said that, there are 1500 species that have been observed to have some sort of like queer relationship or Mm -hmm. um queerness to them and that right there should be like enough to to negate the the naysayers and a really important thing with that too is that's the species that are observed and like they're making the point there are countries where it is illegal still and that makes doing that kind of research really hard because they're not going to give you like the permits that you need to do a lot of research if they don't like what you're researching. <laughs> That's where like a lot of the the problems in science come from is we see it as such a like, this is fact, this is everything, but there are a lot of barriers to actually getting to that knowledge. So then we're left with extrapolating based off of our perceptions of what the world's like. And depending on who's doing the science, that is going to affect what we say the results are. Yeah, and I mean, there's a huge overlap with history also, and that's part of what we do here at Closeted History is like, you know, that a lot of queer history has been suppressed and like even the science related to queerness has also been suppressed. Many people don't know about the Hirschfeld Center in Germany, the way that that was subjected to book burning and they suppressed the institute. Um, because there was science coming out, you know, validating what people were already experiencing and it, it kind of holds true with this subject, even though it's about different things too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that focus on one, just heteronormative like belief systems, and then also the way that we use our language in general to say like, Mm -hmm. you know, the way that we talk about the things we're observing, even if we're not necessarily thinking of it as like, you know, a man and a woman have sex and that's it. Like there's still there's words that imply that kind of idea, too. And we're using we still use that a lot in our in in the science that we're doing, even even in this documentary. Like I, I feel like I notice sometimes um, throughout it, like when they're talking about the hyenas and how their clits are absolutely massive. They're like, it looks like a penis. And while that's great for like the general public to understand like why to relate it to something that they know visually, you're mm-hmm. calling a clitoris a pseudo phallus because like you're defaulting back to a penis. And like, it's just like everything again, like a world designed for men kind of thing. And like even more mm-hmm. so like straight men and even more so straight white men and down that chain. <laughs> For sure, it's like just reinforcing what's already like heteronormative and, you know, cis, het, white dudes of what's palatable. Um, I did want to go back to uh, something that you said about like how some of the research has been suppressed because, you know, in some places of the world it is illegal to be LGBTQ+. But I, I want to touch on the UK's relationship 
to that that like you know those sodomy laws you have to think about like where did that come from you know when the uk colonized a lot of parts of the world that some of their laws also came with them and subsequently that impacted the dynamics within that country in that regard i'm sure in a lot of different ways but specifically for this conversation that you know the UK definitely has something to do with that. So I think that it's just important context to provide for folks because, you know, sometimes um, people can be very xenophobic about places of the world that it is illegal to be queer, but that, again, we have to think about the history and the context of where that comes from. Yeah, I think that's a very great point and important um, as we're looking at, like, we're trying to decide why science is saying certain things. Part of it is, you know, the same reason. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that's the cool part about learning about that part of history is that like really you can see the way that it's seeped its tentacles into everything. Um, and, you know, once you start seeing it and unraveling it, then like it all kind of makes sense and comes together um so it's it's important to like know the the history of the science and the science of the history you know <laughs> absolutely and i think a lot of times like the history or like the social aspects are completely removed in science like historically it's you know been deemed that scientists are like so impartial and like really get just like straight up facts and that's it and if a person is doing science, that's impossible. Mm -hmm. You can't separate like who you are and like the social conditioning that you have or the country that you live in or like the jobs that you've had or anything from the work that you're putting out because the people you're surrounded by and the things you've been taught are going to affect your perception. And then whatever you write down as the science is then going to affect people even more because people are going to now be like, this is science, this is fact. And if you went in and were like, I just don't believe that being gay exists, then you're going to tell people that's fact. And that's what happened with a lot of <laughs> with a lot of these animals. Yeah, well, and now that we're like bringing this up that, you know, Charles Darwin is a uh, a man of many great contributions to science, but to hear him talk about queerness in that way, you know, of course, you have your material conditions that do contextualize where you are within history, but that it was a, a little bit hard. I didn't know that about you. <laughs> and um, now I know. Yeah, don't meet your heroes, especially in the scientific community. So many like super prolific, like highly praised scientists were like straight up eugenicists, like really horrible stuff comes out of them. One thing that they they mentioned a little bit in the documentary, like Charles Darwin being a product of his time. And that's, mm -hmm. I feel like, also something I have a problem with, which I understand Same. the notion. And it is like, it is true because the conditions that you live under, like, affect you and all that. But at the same time, like, not everyone was that way. Like, there were, there are always some people who are not, like, super homophobic or super horrible in whatever way that I feel like you can't use that so much as a defense, but we are very eager to do so. <laughs> Yeah, I I also have issues with that phrase. I think that it like lets people off the hook a little bit. Exactly. And but you know, like no one's perfect, of course, and like you learn and once you know better, you do better, but I think that if he were witnessing that that like if his goal was to to do so from a scientific lens that like all right buddy <laughs> just <laughs> stick to the science then you know exactly um, and they really like did not stick to the science like these like old famous scientists like it it was obviously colored by like their perceptions and like their notes can say like a lot of horrible things a lot of the times that we look back at now and we're like no way <laughs> You were saying that, like, you know, sometimes they're, like, eugenicist. And I watched this documentary on eugenics one time mm -hmm. and found out that so many people were involved in that and, like, that that's literally what inspired the the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, like, I think even as I, I'm a biologist, I went to school to study wildlife and stuff. So even within um, 
like in the 2010s of like academics the professors that I have in like the very modern day sometimes are just like a bunch of old white guys and like they're even saying stuff that certainly isn't correct so it's it's not just a old timey old white guy problem it's like very much built into a lot of the fabrics of science because of all the barriers to getting into science and that's where labor comes in and connects back to it all. that's right that's right <laughs> Because it's like it's a systemic issue that like, you know, it's not going to just be this one old white dude who has very antiquated ideas about the queer community. You know, it it comes out in the educational materials. It comes out in people's personal biases, the way they teach their kids. Um, So, yeah, maybe I'll do an episode one day like about eugenics and it's <laughs> yeah. choke hold on our society but like even the woman who established planned parenthood yeah was a eugenicist yep it's so. really really crazy and i guess trying to connect back again the the idea that we're just like this person did so many positive things too that we'll just be like that's of the time period we can excuse it. I feel like just leaves a lot of room to continue believing the exact same things mm-hmm. because nothing's going to happen about it. Everyone's going to be like, well, <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> it just goes unchecked. Yeah. Like it, it just goes unchecked for sure. And then we don't yeah. learn all this cool stuff about all these animals like or you know, plants or non-plant, non-animals that we're still figuring out like fungi and how they have 23,000 different sexes. That's yeah. wild. Fungi are <laughs> just like wonders of the world. <laughs> we we know like such a small fraction about them of like what they actually are. That's That's one thing that I wish about this documentary that there was like a part two maybe. And they could Mm -hmm. dive into more of some of the things that they like mentioned a little bit of, but didn't really dive into. Like, I feel like talking about that, about like fungi specifically, is so revolutionary to like what we're kind of taught to think about the world and like categorizing things and people that I feel Mm -hmm. like that would really be mind blowing in a lot of ways and also help with understanding humanity and why people feel so different and why now that people are finally able to be a lot more vocal about it, why it's Mm -hmm. completely fine (laughs) and just normalizing that idea more from like a very still scientific perspective. I feel like a whole special Mm -hmm. could have been done on just fungi. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I did want to say that once they got to Mexico, so I feel like this is kind of like some low key racist shit. When they went to Mexico, they like the music that they were playing was like, spanish music Mm -hmm. and like first of all it's it's presenting itself as a documentary so i feel like you know the goal is to be factual the goal is to represent things as they are and try to be as objective as possible so like y'all couldn't look into like (laughs) music that represents this part of the world And they didn't do that for any other parts of the world. So, like, why is it suddenly different for Mexico? You're, you know, playing something that you think is supposed to be Mexican, but, like, it's not. Yeah. (laughs) And just use the normal music that you had in all the other places. So I I thought that was really... (laughs) That is so strange. And I I have a lot of complaints about, like, the audio stuff that documentaries add in. And I don't know if that's... In some cases, like maybe it's a little too much the way I feel about it, but that seriously, yes, I agree. <laughs> um, and then even beyond that, like I think it's weird for documentaries to add in sound effects so often. Um, mm-hmm. And I had a long discussion about this today, so I understand that like cameras are happening from far away, but like if you can't get the audio of like the penguin feet slapping the ground, maybe don't add it in. I feel like it's the same thing of like this is a documentary. Sometimes we're going too Mm -hmm. far with the sounds we're adding in. And that is like opening up things that are like wrong. Like if you're putting in the wrong bird calls in the background, like a lot of like just regular media does or Mm -hmm. really, really insensitive (laughs) 
and like just culturally unaware of what they're doing when it comes to the music they use so it is it's something weird but it's so so common in documentaries I feel like a lot of them will be like here's some regional music and it's just it's a little like unnecessary (laughs) yeah yeah I haven't watched a documentary in a while Mm -hmm. so I feel like maybe like that's something that I'll have to try to notice now yeah um but Overall, I did like the the documentary. I feel like I had like very few complaints, and I feel like it was very good for entry level. Yeah. Um, and it, because you know I'm not a biologist, I'm not uh, what's it called when they study mushrooms? Mycologist. Mycolog- yep, I'm not one of those <laughs> either. So. You know, I I think that it was very approachable, but like the science wasn't, you know, too heavy where it was like, okay, this is kind of dry and a little bit boring. Absolutely. Um, so I felt like it, it it was a really good balance. It was yeah. A really good balance. Absolutely. I think there are things that I wish were included or would be in a sequel. Um, or there's a couple of things that I had problems with that we talked about already. And like, some ways that they focused on things I feel like still wasn't where I would want it to be like even just they talked about the side blotched lizards and how they have like the different colors of them have different like are different male sexes still um Mm -hmm. and there's also two female like sexes or genders that Mm -hmm. they didn't really they said they had them and then didn't say anything about them at all so it's, it's just interesting to see little things like that of like you're doing it anyway you could just throw it in but where where focuses still are in mainstream media um is still, still very like m- male oriented yeah yeah exactly like even with some inclusion it's still got to be male centered like you yeah. said like you know it's a fake penis as opposed to like no it's a big ass clit yeah and like they give <laughs> birth out of that that's crazy and we talked about that for one second and then moved on we focused on like mostly like like different animals that are male having sex and then we did say like the japanese macaques all of them prefer having sex with female macaques no matter what gender they are but Mm -hmm. i feel like it's there's a lot of there's just a lot of places where they could spread the focus a little bit more but Mm -hmm. i agree it's a great entry level thing especially if you don't have a scientific background i feel like it was pretty accessible and I really like that they added in like the stuff about historic suppression and a few jabs about old men and museums in England. (laughs) I think that was great. Um, And I just still want more. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to see kind of like a a follow up from them. Some sort of like, like maybe a a special just on fungi, Mm -hmm. even though it represented both asexual and like sexual relationships. I feel like naturally, like maybe I'm just like being weird about it, but like it was very heavily sexualized. Yeah, it's not something that we do a lot to queer communities. And that also causes problems because then everyone's like, this is a hypersexual community. I can't have my family and my kids knowing about that. And it's like, well, every everything is the same amount of sexual pretty much, except for bonobos who have sex with everything all the time. But like... (laughs) Like not it's it's really yeah. not like they're just trying to tell you about it, but unfortunately, that's the way it went. Yeah, well, I feel relieved that like you kind of felt that way too because I was like, well, you know, maybe I'm just like being sensitive about it because I do find that you know I've only done a couple of movies here on the podcast, mm-hmm. but um, in media, often LGBTQ plus people are very sexualized. And I think that for non LGBTQ plus people, a lot of times their reference is porn. Yeah. Which like, you know, I I can't do anything about that, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but I I think that like when it's perpetuated by media that then it can be a little bit harmful. Which, uh, to a certain extent, like, that is what the documentary was about, mm-hmm. was, like, showcasing that there are queer sexual relationships that happen in nature. Um, but I think maybe they could have just, like, 
ordered it a little bit different or set up the sequence differently to because it was just like oh here's a lot of sex yeah and then you got to the end and it's like okay now we'll talk about asexual stuff yeah and they like they included some family stuff and i think that there are a ton more examples of things like that which is also just as interesting um and there was yeah the whole thing was shots of different animals boning like Oh, the whole thing and there was that whole sequence with one of the primates that was just like <laughs> they had like fun fast music to be like this is crazy um, which is maybe not the thing that we want people to be leaving with from this documentary and I really understand the intention of being like this is completely natural and it's time that everyone accepts that and like understands it like scientifically no one has told you yet but this is happening everywhere but i think what a lot of like newer media that is being more aware or sharing more information with people kind of falls falls short in now is that there's so much context and so much historic discrimination and it's hard to cover all of those portions when you're trying to make like mm-hmm. a, an hour and a half movie but if you miss something you're also reinforcing it and that is tough yeah yeah well just like the things that they chose to focus on i think that overall they did a good job but that like instead of the the montage of like (laughs) you know yes (laughs) monkeys like having sex with each other like okay we could have spent a little bit longer on you know the the animals that have giant clits Mm -hmm. that literally birth yeah other beings out of that (laughs) or just to see some of those variations because that's not necessarily about sex but it does like show us that there are natural variations in genitals like for different species so like while it might be a good entry point i would say like with a a little asterisk i yeah yeah and that you were you've been talking a little bit about like the a little bit of representation for the asexual animals or like the partially asexual animals and stuff they actually all focused on animals that are super closely related so ants and bees and all of those and termites are like in the same group so that's Mm -hmm. why they have that very similar like colony structure but there are a lot of animals that reproduce asexually it's called parthenogenesis fun new word Mm -hmm. um and there was just recently a a kind of famous example at uh it was a north american aquarium i think um down south somewhere but they had a stingray that was pregnant and there was no other stingrays there i think her name was charlotte Mm -hmm. so love that um (laughs) and (laughs) there was like a whole like social media went crazy to be like what did a shark get her pregnant or like some other species get her pregnant or is that a clone kind of thing And there Mm -hmm. are a lot of animals that like will just have a clone of themselves and give birth to that. Like instead of having the egg be like haploid, it'll be have all the genetic material it needs and it'll be an exact copy of the parent. Sharks Mm -hmm. do it like stick bugs do it. It's another bug. But like there's a lot of animals that can do that. And it's really, really interesting. So they could. I could do a whole follow up on that too. Yeah, it I feel like the way that they presented like the asexual species um that it kind of seemed like like an afterthought that like oh yeah, we should probably do some asexual representation too. And I I definitely wanted to hear more about intersex animals. Yes. Cuz I think that people learning more about intersex people will help people understand like like true variation in sex like in in humans Mm -hmm. that you know very rarely does nature do binaries (laughs) that often it is a spectrum Mm -hmm. and the whole thing with the olympics like if if we learned anything from that that like gender is made up (laughs) like You know, we all see that, like, there are certain characteristics that don't fit into the molds that we have for what we deem as a man and what we deem as a woman. It can be, and it is very fluid. So I I think that it would have been really cool to kind of showcase more of the intersex animals. um, Yeah. Because I think that that 
is a really important part of the conversation that is missing um, and really helps people understand some of those variations. Yeah, because we got like a little bit about the clownfish um, mm -hmm. and we got at like very close to the end to the bighorn sheep. They talked about like these, they call them like these males who are just hanging out with the female herd, take on the female characteristics of like, they don't want to be mounted most of the year. They squat to pee. They're very like chill and not aggressive. Like they're not fighting like all the males that travel together are. And I, mm -hmm. I think stuff like that would definitely be really interesting to focus on. And I wonder if we're like using the right terms there by just calling them like an interesting male who hangs out with the girls. Like we obviously can't ask the sheep what they think about it, but like I, if we could, I'm really wondering. Would you like to use? <laughs> yeah, like I'm wondering if that again, like that language bias is a problem in everything, but is I think a really big problem in science of like we can't even communicate what we're seeing correctly necessarily, and like we're not getting that point across for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Or we could just have a whole special on fungi and their 23,000 plus sexes and be like, okay, there's no binary. There's a something, the word for a thousand. Like there's so many. And it, it would be very good to see that it really isn't like two options or like two and like sometimes a fun third. Like there is no, mm -hmm. no standard there. Yeah, yeah, and it was interesting to also see how, like, some of the animals don't follow, like, the heteronormative, like, you know, stereotypical roles of males and females. Yeah, who forgot to tell um, them? <laughs> like... <laughs> exactly. So I, I think that the people that we obviously want this to target are, uh, are not listening. Like, no. <laughs> the, the, the people who need to know this information... Well, I won't say that because I feel like everyone needs to know the information, but I think that unfortunately the people who could benefit the most from watching this, um, they're not going to watch this. But <laughs> I think that for folks like you and I, um, and hopefully folks who listen to the podcast, that it can really serve as a good starting place. Um because, you know, you are a scientist and you still got a lot of benefits and learned a lot from it. My partner, as I mentioned to you, mm -hmm. um, is also a scientist. He is a biochemist. And he just thought it was the coolest thing. He was like, oh, my God, thank you so much for watching this with me. <laughs> and I was like, well, thank you for watching <laughs> with me. He was like, yeah, we got to learn together. So it um, is really cool. Know. It is. It's, it's yeah. so interesting. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that even for folks like us, it is still a, a good and valuable resource. Um, there were some things that we, we really loved about it, and we're we're going to hassle them to get the fungi <laughs> special. Some things that we didn't like about it. Um, but so what would you give it, like, out of 10 hmm. overall for a documentary? Because I, I feel like... yeah. There's a different ranking system for documentaries than there are for regular films. So I feel like understanding the goal and knowing that it's not for like somebody who like is super entrenched in science or super entrenched in even like knowing about queer history or like any kind of like justice that it's for anybody. I feel like an eight or even a nine um, because I think that it it does do a lot of good entry level stuff. It doesn't get super radical so it's like kind of for everybody um mm -hmm. but it still includes a little bit of history and like perspective um and it is really cool they got some good footage and <laughs> focused on cool animals some stuff i didn't know either yeah some of the species i didn't even know existed um so i i think i would i'm with you that i would also give it like an eight mm -hmm. i think that um, I liked some of the shots and I loved getting to learn about my, my fellow queer people <laughs> and, and species. Um, and I do also like that once they talked about all of the like different species um, and animals and, you know, all the things that they also touched on like, oh yeah, also in humans, <laughs> 
So, like, not only did it give you an introduction to the animals and different species that we see in nature, but then also they kind of tied it back to, like, yeah, we also see it in humans. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think that is an important connecting point for people, like, especially being new to be like, just remember the reason why we're doing this is so that you get it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, it. okay, you got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this feels like a good stopping place. Um, I feel like I, I checked off all of my boxes on things that I wanted to talk about. Did you hit all of your points as well? Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> thank okay, you. Okay, <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much for being a guest, um, your very first time on a podcast. Yay, thank you for uh, having so, me. So, yeah, of course. And do you want to tell the good people where you can find uh, your book club and more info about you? Yeah. So again, it's Workers Reading Book Club. You can find us on Instagram and uh, some social media like TikTok and Storygraph at Workers Reading. Um, and right now we use Fable for our discussion boards and we're working on getting Zoom as well. Um, so you can find us online for now at Workers Reading. And the other thing I want to say, just because it connects back to what this documentary was, is that one of the scientists in the documentary, Dr. Uh, Patricia Cation, has mm -hmm. a book coming out in May 27th, 2025. It will be called Forest Euphoria, and it's um, going to be 10 essays about queerness in nature. So that will expand on fungi and also a few other species. And I... I know Dr. Cation and have read a lot of writings already published. Um, so I will definitely, I can say I recommend that as a resource in the future. It'll probably be in the book club. And to hear more from her, she's also done a queer ecology webinar through uh, Advaya, A-D-V-A-Y-A. Mm -hmm. So you can find that on YouTube. Um, and also an episode of Getting Curious with Jonathan Van Ness. So there's more resources if you want to dive deeper into things, especially fungi, because I apparently am biased in that direction. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for being on. Um, and thank you all for listening. And we will catch you in the next one.